Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 298. Hey, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. Well, this week, our guest is Brian Bradley. Brian is a leading educator and asset protection attorney for high-risk professionals, entrepreneurs, real estate investors, and high net worth families. Brian's goal is to give you peace of mind knowing your assets are safe. Brian also acts as a chief knowledge officer for law firms across the country, helping them maximize their value along with technology integration. Today, we're going to talk with Brian about what exactly is asset protection, why it's important to you as a real estate investor now more so than ever, and how you can get started with an asset protection plan that fits your portfolio and your needs today. So without further ado, let's jump right into this week's episode. All right, today I welcome on the show, Brian Bradley. Brian, hey, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Jacob, for having me on and putting this podcast together. And, you know, it's really is a big topic that we're going to talk about today, but it's necessary for anyone who owns anything or is thinking of owning something, investing and, you know, trying to get to that financial wealth and freedom stage. And so we're going to break down some really good key concepts for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. In times of uncertainty, that's where my mind gravitates to is, you know, protecting your downside. I'm sure many people out there have similar concerns, but let's just kind of first back up, start with, Asset protection in general, like what exactly is it? What does that mean? Is it the same for everybody out there? Just kind of give us a high level, your take on asset protection. Yeah. So asset protection, it's not traditional estate planning. You know, like there's nothing in a revocable living will or trust, revocable living trust that's going to be able to protect you. It's just, they're not designed for that. So it's modern planning. And what we're doing is placing legal barriers between your assets and your potential creditors. Like that's basically it. You know, it's just a barrier like a safe for your gold or your guns that you're going to put them in. And then anything of value you want to put behind the barrier so that it's not easily attacked with, you know, or a creditor or trying to be reached through the legal system. Now, for people who grew up with like an old school mindset where lawsuits really were never an issue, you know, back about 40 years ago, you could essentially get away with having everything in your own personal name or into just your family trust. That was acceptable then. And you can get away with that about, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. But over the past 40 years of litigation landscapes completely changed. You know, things that didn't happen in the past are happening now, such as contingency fee lawyers, you know, working off a percentage of a case, law firm advertising. Law firms weren't allowed to advertise. And so none of those were commonplace, but they are now, and they completely changed the landscape of the litigation field. Now, you know, unfortunately, we're the most sue happy nirvana country in the world. <laughs> That's like 98% of all the lawsuits come through the US. And if you're perceived to really? be a have, yeah, if you're perceived to be a have, you know, all the have nots or the people who are angry are going to sue you, or there's just massive amount of predatory lawsuits now. And so asset protection is your modern best bet at attempting to level the playing field by using all the different legal tools that we have, you know, and what this does is make it very hard for a creditor to collect on you. And at the end of the day, you know, you really can't do a lot about getting people not to sue you because that's just the legal system. But what you can do is set up a system to see how collectible you are. And so at the end of the day, asset protection is just creating peace of mind. And there's just different levels and stages and strengths as the stop goes. You know, like if you're starting out, you're not going to start out with a Taj Mahal. But as you grow, you scale up. Yeah, makes sense. So I think I like what you say there. You know, it's kind of scalable, right? So that, you know, beginning real estate investor that maybe just owns a duplex, maybe they can think of a strategy where they protect that asset from liability or vice versa from themselves, all the way scaling up to 
successful real estate syndicators having you know hundreds or thousands of doors across the country. There's kind of a model for everyone. It's just a sliding scale, right? There is. And I think one of the misconceptions is too expensive. Well, there's different levels. You know, like there's a roadmap that will break down and key concepts that will go through um, where you're at. But when you're starting out, you know, don't say like, okay, I'm going to go spend $30,000 to protect one or two units. That's ridiculous. You start with an LLC. And then as you grow, your whole point is, yeah, I want to be a millionaire. Once you start getting to that level, there's different things we do to consolidate those LLCs, make it more simplified for tax filings with management companies. And then we come in with the big guns, the asset protection trust. Yeah, sure. Well, Brian, how complicated does it have to be getting started out from somebody going from zero to having an asset protection strategy kind of formulated and put in place? They're not really difficult at all. And they're not in the sense of like understanding how to use them or... Or just implementing it, setting it up. It seems like, you know, people out there might be thinking like, oh, it just sounds too complicated. I don't even know where to start. It sounds expensive, like you said. I'm just going to... Yeah, it's really not. You know, like we'll just start... Yeah, so we'll just start with, you know, the basic entry level, an LLC. It's pretty easy to set up an LLC. You know, you can go and create one online if you want. I generally don't recommend that. I would say have a professional create them for you because when you get challenged in court, it always comes down to the details. Devil's in the details. Same thing, <laughs> LLCs and operating agreements, transferring title properly and making sure banks don't get upset about that. It's not that difficult to set up. Just I would recommend call a lawyer, pay the you know range of $1,000 to $2,000 range and budget that into your finances. So it's a good entry level. LLCs are cheap for that standpoint. And they're great points of entry. Yeah, sure. Well, maybe somebody's thinking like, hey, you know, it doesn't add to my bottom line. If anything, it takes away, you know, it's going to be a cost and I'd rather not incur that cost. You know, as a beginning real estate investor, many people out there are very focused on cash flow and, you know, trying to build up this passive income, right? And it might just look like another hurdle, another expense to have to pay in the long run. What would you say to somebody like that? I would say you need to budget and plan before something happens. And so, you know, so what is it saying? Penny wise, dollar stupid. Yes. You know, <laughs> yeah. And it's exactly what it comes to is part of your business that you're going into is creating a business structure or an entity. And you have to plan properly. That means you have to have a CPA and you need to be able to have your um, tax identifications done properly, your tax disclosures and your system. So just budget for that because if you start doing this after the fact, it's not going to work for you. Yeah, sure. Now, so say you've got somebody who's maybe got a handful of properties, they've got them in LLCs, they're starting to scale up. Do you think, when is a critical mass when you need to kind of switch strategies in terms of putting a property in a new LLC every time? How long does that model work? What's the next step? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to break it down in like two simple concepts because what we're trying to do at that point was call it level the playing field between legal and practical authority. And so legal what this, and practical authority. Okay. Yeah. And so it's a big mumble jumble legal <laughs> analogy of just what is it that a judge can do and what is it that a judge actually does? Legal authority is just saying, here's the laws, they're written, here's the case law. For example, I set up a Nevada LLC and the limiting order for a judgment is just a charging order. You shouldn't be able to bleed into personal assets. Theoretically, that's how things should work, even if you're a California resident or a resident in another state. They should just follow and adhere to those statutes and laws. But we all know that practicality you know, and theory really never mix. And so what we really are combating is a judge's and court's practical authority. And that's the power a judge actually has to make decisions. You know, A judge has very broad powers to reaching your assets, including seizing them, placing them on you know, liens, foreclosures, ordering sheriff sales, clearing titles so they can be sold, wage garnishments. And so the problem is judges, even without legal authority to do this, do these things by exercising their practical authority. And they have a superpower that's called the court of equity. They just can make a decision that's contradictory to law to make, level the playing field. It's just called equitable disbursements. And so this is what you're battling. And they can do this in direct contradiction to established statutes and case laws. And so the result is that that court, that judge, his practical authority just took your asset with no legal authority to do it. And so the solution here is to hinder that judge's authority over your assets so that they can't circumvent the legal process. And we do this with LLCs. Now, to answer that question directly that you asked, 
as you're adding more assets, you want to limit the amount of assets you put into each LLC. Right. Because if one property goes boom, you don't want it to bleed into a bunch of other assets. Sure. And so generally you look at how much equity you have in an LLC and a property. And depending on what state, we generally go with the rule of thumb. We don't want more than a million dollars or you know half a million dollars of equity into one LLC. And it's a range just because if you are investing in California, for example, you know, it's really unlikely to be able to get more than one property into an LLC, you know, that's less than a million dollars. Sure. But then if you're investing in the Midwest, that can be two to four properties. And so it just depends on where you're at and how much equity you're playing with. But then you start dividing up similar assets into different LLCs. But that starts becoming a CPA, you know, nightmare and it's going to start getting expensive on tax filings. So the next level up is an asset management limited partnership. And what those do is own all your LLCs, which own all your property. And then what you're doing is now just streamlining the tax filing and you're filing one tax filing on and all the K1s throw straight through that management company. And then you can do all of your contracting through that management company. And then you can have your bank account to that management company. And then by having a limited partnership, the general partnership is going to own all of those LLCs and you're going to be the managing member. And then there's a dual ownership of limited partnerships. So you can then have the bridge trust or an asset management trust own that minority partnership portion of that management company. Mm -hmm. And that trust is now going to own that entire management company, which then owns the LLCs. And then you're just the beneficiary of it. Okay. So going to that asset management limited partnership structure, Mm -hmm. how does that compare or contrast to a series LLC? Yeah, that's a great question. The problem with series LLC, I I like series LLCs. I use them, but I only recommend them and use them for people who live in the states that have the legislation and statutes. And those are not very many states, correct? There's not very many. And the reason is optics. So let's say I'm a California resident who already hates asset protection systems and is doing everything in the world to not, you know, adhere to them. And I own (laughs) assets in other states and I create a Texas um, series LLC. And I get get sued in California or one of my other properties I get sued in and that state doesn't recognize series LLC statutes. What's going to happen is that state that you're sued in are going to use their state laws through damages and tort claims. And so they're going to say, I don't care that you have a Texas series LLC. We're not Texas. We don't adhere to them. The laws that are going to apply are in my state, in my court. And that's what the problem is. Not every state recognizes them. And so as you're investing wherever you're going to find a deal, it's not worth the risk for me. But I do use them if the clients are residents of those states that have those statutes and the property and assets are in those states. Then I have no problem with it. Okay. That's an interesting point you bring up because I think there's some confusion and maybe still a little bit on my part, admittedly, on what laws take effect if you have a property in state A and you live in state B. They're going to explain that. Yes. Like the numb down the point is, you know, because I'm a trial lawyer, like super lawyer, rising star list, lawyer distinction list, trial lawyer, you know, this is what I do. They're going to apply the laws and the damage laws because what you're doing is suing somebody for money for damages. And it's generally through torts and negligence and fraud. Those are state specific laws. And so they're going to, wherever that lawsuit comes through, you may have a business in Delaware or Texas or Wyoming. Those, you're not being sued through business law. You're being sued through damages and tort law, contract law, fraud. And so those are the laws and statutes that are going to be used. So it comes down to where you live. Is that fair? It comes or down no? to where the lawsuit's going to be filed at. And the lawsuit's going to be filed at in the state where the damage happened, which is going to be that asset. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So Brian, let's propose a scenario for the audience members listening in right now. Let's say that you have an asset, a rental property, and let's say Oklahoma, you reside in Texas. And that asset is in an LLC incorporated in, let's say, Nevada. How would that scenario play out if you as the landlord were litigated, say, from your tenant? Yeah, so you're getting sued in Oklahoma. And so what's going to happen is most likely 90% of that is going to be through tort, which is like personal injury. So it's going to be like negligence or wrongful death, okay, um, some kind of claim like that. And you're going to get sued through that state in Oklahoma state laws. 
you're not getting sued for a business organizational lawsuit. And so those judges are just going to say, we don't care. The laws in Nevada don't apply here. This is Oklahoma. It's an Oklahoma lawsuit for an Oklahoma injury on Oklahoma damages. We're going to use Oklahoma state statutes and case law. Okay. And that's how that plays out. So what good does your Nevada LLC do at that point? That's why that when we break down things different, it's called jurisdiction. And then there's things called full protection and maybe protection. And that's where when you're starting with LLCs, you need to realize it's an entry level position. So it's called maybe protection. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll be upheld. Maybe it won't. Different states have different charging orders and some are strong and some are good. Yes. But like you just saw, where's the weakness of this? One, it can be pierced and you can be held personally liable. Two, if you have investments out of in different states and you're trying to throw all these different assets into a LLC that's not in that state, what happens? They're not going to be upheld, but the laws of the state are going to be used. That's why when you create strong asset protection structures, you always create the LLC where the asset's at because that's where the lawsuit's going to be at. You don't go use other states' LLCs because the optics are bad. And then generally, those, you're not going to be able to use Texas law in Oklahoma or Nevada law in Oklahoma. So the point of it is they're good entry points and it, something's better than nothing. And then what you're doing with entry point structures like LLCs is trying to increase the amount of money the opposing party is going to spend to try to get a judgment on you, hoping that they don't see the profit line of it, or it's just too much time for them to waste. And then you're trying to force them to a negotiating table sooner than later. But the problem is most lawyers who even get out of law school know that they can go in front of a judge and generally try to pierce the veil pretty quick. And so something's better than nothing, like I said. So LLCs are great starting points especially as you're new to investing. But as you go, just like most investors, you're going to add another LLC. Then you get the management company. The management company streamlines it to where it's easier to manage as a business and it's easier to file your taxes on. But when you want actual asset protection that's going to be strong, you create the, you put the assets in an LLC in that state where the asset's owned. And then you create an asset protection trust and they can either be domestic or foreign, and then that will own everything there. And that's where your true protection comes in because, for example, we'll break down the difference, right? I'll just do it right now. You can create an asset protection trust two ways. You can either create them in the US or you can create them offshore in like the Cook Islands. And so I prefer when it's needed and necessary to go offshore in the Cook Islands. That's just because you have what's called statutory non recognition. And this is just saying we don't recognize any other countries or courts or judges court orders. This is the Cook Islands. You have to sue us here. Now, nothing really beats statutory non-recognition. And so what this means is, like I said, that your judgment is worthless in the Cook Islands. They have to sue you there and they'd have to prove their case beyond the murder standard, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. They'd have to front all the court costs and fly in a judge from New Zealand. You can't take your US attorneys with you. There's only a one-year statute. So there's a lot of barriers to entry to get into the Cook Islands, and most people can't do it. So what that does is forces you to settle cases if I'm suing you for pennies on the dollar, because there's no way I'm even going to exercise the U.S. judgment because it's not recognized where the assets are at anymore. And so that's the power of going for it. But it's expensive. And so not everybody needs that kind of, you know, very, very, very strong protection all the time. So 95% of our clients, we don't recommend to go purely for it. So now you can create these domestically here in the US. The issue with it is sort of like the issue with series LLCs. Only 17 states have some sort of asset protection, self-settled spendthrift legislation. If you don't live in one of those states, you're not going to be able to get the benefit from it. Because let's say you're a California resident and I create a Nevada asset protection trust, you're already seeing case law, like there's this case, Stilker v. Kielman, 2012. And this case was upheld in the Court of Appeals that said, We don't care if you have a Nevada Asset Protection Trust. You're a California resident. Those trusts are made for the residents of those states. So we're not going to adhere to those choice of law venues. And all the assets are now open to be collected on, to exercise a judgment on. And you're also seeing certain states whittle away their own legislation for asset protection. So if asset protection and protection is really important to you, really the strongest system that you have is going foreign. But like I said, it can be costly and then you have to file extra 
IRS reporting and disclosures, which people really don't want to do. But you can marry the two together. You can get a best of both worlds situation. And it's called a bridge trust. And so the trust is going to be created. We use the word bridge just as an analogy of your trust is going to be a domestic. And then when you get sued, we can trigger the trust and then cross the bridge into the foreign aspect part of the trust. We're just combining the best of both worlds. And it was created over 30 years ago. So it's not new. It's been tested in courts. And then we just cross the bridge, like I said, to the safety of the Cook Islands, if and when it's needed by using migration clauses. And then for the dive in a little bit of the deeper part of it, of how this actually works, the Bridge Trust is an irrevocable tax neutral grantor trust. And why you want that trust to be irrevocable is that if you ever are challenged and in front of a judge and the judge says, hey, I see you own assets and we think you have control over them, and that judge tells you to bring those assets back to collect on, you don't have the power at that point to do it. And so you can't be held in civil contempt to force you to do it. So the assets just sit there safe until the case settles, which you are now in a position of strength to force that settlement because the other attorneys realize there, even if we got a million or $300 million judgment, we're never going to be able to collect on it. And so they don't want to waste the time, energy, and resources. And so this is how you force settlements, even against the IRS and SEC and the government. You know, and there's a lot of supporting case law to go with this. And then what a grantor trust means is that you, the person who created it, still are going to maintain the powers over your assets to invest how you want. So you're not just freezed out and locked out. They're just protected now. And then uh, they're self-settled, meaning by you for yourself as your own beneficiary. And so the way that this works is because we maintain compliance with USC section 7701, and this is the court test and the control test. And so I know we went over a lot and <laughs> I know it's so good. how it all works, I think this is a great summary of, you know, it all works and comes together like this. The first layer is your base layer, you know, just like dressing up to go out on the cold. You know, you don't just put on a jacket, you put on a base layer. That's your LLC. And that holds your real estate and other assets. And you're going to create those LLCs in the state where that asset's held, because that's where you're going to get sued from. And then, you know, and you want to use the LLCs and anything that can hurt somebody or has a key or go boom goes into there. You know, the next layer is your mid layer. That's your asset management limited partnership, which acts as your holding company. And it's going to hold the bulk of all your assets, like your cash, your stocks, your bonds, your receivables. It's going to own the ownership shares of those LLCs. You know, essentially anything that can hurt somebody goes in there. The LLCs, like I said, are held inside that AMLP, what asset management limited partnership. Yes. You, the client, will be the general partner of the AMLP. This gives you control of the assets and they're being held in the holding company. Okay. The final layer, your outer shell, you know, we're going outside into the weather, is going to be the bridge trust. And it's going to be the minority limited partner ownership of that AMLP. And that's the controlling interest. So it's the ownership interest. This separates ownership from use and enjoyment. And then let's say, you know, two things happen. You either die many, many years from now and your assets get distributed per the directors of your living trust. Or there's a crisis, like a lawsuit, something happened, the bridge trust is triggered, and the assets cross the bridge, and now you have the power and strength of statutory non-recognition in the Cook Islands, if and when you need it. When the lawsuit goes away and gets settled, the assets transfer back domestically. I find all of this stuff really fascinating, Brian. A lot of it's very new to me. Some of it's a bit over my head, admittedly. But I yeah. really like you know, the simplified approach. You start, you know, beginning investor, you go out buy a duplex. I think that first line of defense as I see it, tell me if you agree here, is you know you obviously have insurance, right? You've got a bit of liability insurance, mm -hmm. property insurance, et cetera, to be that first line of defense against slips, trips, falls of your tenant, Correct. right? You also have very maybe little equity in the property. So maybe you've bought this duplex with a low FHA, low down payment option, right? So you've got very little equity to go after anyways. Perhaps you don't have many assets in your name additionally. So then carrying on, you've got this LLC, right? Once you start to gain equity or maybe more properties, you start implementing another protection of asset protection being this LLC, right? And then from there, you can kind of grow and scale into this AMLP, right? Asset yeah. Management Limited Partnership and yeah. so on and so on. So yeah. you don't have to get overwhelmed as being an investor out there like, oh gosh, I need to fly to the Cook Islands and no, register exactly. my no. duplex. It's like, 
Exactly. Uh, Just start off where you're at. The only different caveat I would add in that is don't wait till you have the equity in the property to create the LLC because you're still holding everything in your personal name. So what happens when you get sued? Your house and your car are on the line now. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's why at least create a base layer of protection, even if you don't have much equity in that property, because you may have equity somewhere else to come after. So when I'm suing you, I'm looking at your whole financial life and saying, where can I get the money from? I don't care where it comes from. I won't force you to sell your house. I'll force you to sell your car. I'm going to come after you every way that I can. So that's why you create these things right when you start. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. So I kind of like how you break it down there. You know, it's very scalable, approachable from all the way from the beginning investor to the very seasoned investor with a lot of assets. And this doesn't just involve real estate investors, right? Entrepreneurs, well, business owners, business everyone. Owner, yeah, anything. Business owners, you know, you got to protect your ownership interests and your other assets. You know, real estate investors, obviously. Doctor, you know, a big part of my client list are doctors. You know, doctors make a good amount of money and they also have the ability to invest. And then it's just a matter of whatever you're doing, where's all the risk coming from? And then how do we manage it and protect it is really what we're looking at. Well, something I want to kind of dig into is you touched on it earlier. You know, the litigation law in our country has changed, as you said, a lot over the past 40 years. We live in a very litigious society. And nowadays, you know, you see the world around us, very uncertain times, right? So even more so of a reason to kind of think about how you're going to handle a lawsuit when it does come, right? Because they say as a real estate investor, it's not if you'll get sued, it's when, right? So this kind of weird world we're living in right now, talk about the importance more so than in the past of having an asset protection strategy in place. Yeah. So you can't rely on lady luck. You know, I have a lot of older investors who have a lot of properties and don't set anything up. And the reason they didn't was, well, I've been investing for 40 years and I've never been sued. And it's like, you just got, you're lucky. Like luck's not a protection strategy. You know, <laughs> dude, it's too late because the one thing the courts are clear on is proactive. Set these things up before they're needed and we like them. If you try to do this after the fact, that's hindrance, avoidance, that gets into fraudulent transfer arguments. It's going to be harder to do something for you without making it very, very expensive. And at that point, is it worth it? So set the stuff up beforehand. In the litigious world, you know, like I know we were talking about before, I was hesitant on if I wanted to talk about, you know, COVID-19 and liability and where that's going to come from. But like, I almost feel like it has to be talked about now because it's going to change a lot about how we do business and another layer of liability. And so... You know, COVID is a big concern and investors and businesses, like I said, need to understand how it will change and impact their businesses, their employees, customers, brand operation, like revenue going forward. You know, there's simply no doubt that global health and emergencies and financial crises, pandemics, you know, they're going to create risk to wealth. Yeah. It's just that obvious. You can't argue out of that. Very few of us, though, are positioned to handle them and protect ourselves from them or even to benefit financially when there are panics. The key though in any crisis is to first weather the storm. You know, what's obvious is that if income goes down without expenses going down at the same rate, then you're going to start depleting your assets. Income is most likely not yet under your direct control in a crisis. You know, it's you know, the reality part of most of us. So what you do have control over is your expenses. What's critical is your assets because they give you the ability to subsidize that reduced income and ride out a crisis. So they have to be protected so that you can ride out the storm. That's an asset protection system. The sad thing is that you know, we now have to add liability, which is going to be caused by COVID-19, to the list of things that investors and business owners need to start planning for. The result of COVID-19 is not going to be known for a long time. You know, like All the havoc is going to reach. Sure. Um, part of the issue, like I got hesitant of talking about this topic is everything changes so rapidly. So by the time we're recording this to when it airs, we don't even know what's going to change at that point. Yeah, right. But we're all doing the best we can to take care of our families and our loved ones, you know, and we're doing the social distancing and cleaning our hands and trying to get back to work. However, we can find a way to do it uh, continuing investing, but security becomes critical. You know, you want your assets and your equity safe. You want to protect your future and your legacy. What we're looking at legal-wise in the legal bar associations and the litigation arena is concern of a really big or substantial rise of what's called casualty claims and employee claims and other organization claims. So for example, general liability claims alleging negligence from failing to protect a customer or an invitee, 
especially if a death is involved from COVID-19 and they caught it from, you know, where you sent your employee or the premise that they're at. Yeah. And that can extend to family members, not just the employee, you know, so you got to think about that. Or we're talking about casualty insurance claims for negligent acts. And, you know, the government has even been talking about indemnifying certain companies from liability who are mass producing the needed medical supplies and national supplies that we're short on. And we're also preparing for the possibility that insurance industries may experience what's called negative coverage, as some carriers are already excluding COVID-19 from general liability coverage from employers due to the classification of it as an epidemic or a global emergency. And they might exclude the coronavirus altogether from employers' liability coverage. So this is a shot on the foot to casualty claims, and we're, you're now going to be personally liable and on the hook for this if someone catches it or gets sick or a family member from your employment. And as by the World Health Organization classifying COVID-19 as a global health emergency, you know, employers, you know, their liability coverage is most likely not going to apply and cover them. And it's unfortunate and it's obviously well documented through history that as we go through these epidemics or recessions, I don't know if we're going to have one or not, that's to be determined, but lawsuits rise substantially. And so we got to protect ourselves from that. And so what asset protection does is it creates the legal barriers that you're going to need. You know, it levels the playing field if you are attacked. What you need to do as investors and syndicators, landlords, general partners, you know, high-risk professionals, high net worth families, whatever, talk to an asset protection attorney, you know, create a conservative plan before it's needed. And so a few steps to take are to recognize if your income is reduced and your expenses aren't, which is the case right now. That's going to shorten the amount of time that you need to meet your obligations, like, you know, rent, mortgages, you know, yeah. um, all of that. The next step you need to take is to protect your hard assets because they're critical, like I said, to give you the ability to weather the storm. You can't afford to let a creditor decide how to use those assets. You need to decide how to use them. And then the final step is to create a plan. So the first, reduce your expenses quickly and effectively. Don't handicap your businesses, though, to the point that you can actually evolve and grow and thrive. Go through what's critical and what's not. That first few steps that we just talked about, you can do yourself. The second step is, you know, legally securing your assets and protecting them from having a claim um, that can be attached to you. That's where you need to have an asset protection attorney do this for you so it's done properly and do it sooner than later and do both steps sooner than later so they can help you faster. And, you know, a couple questions that your listeners can ask themselves are, you know, do you have employees located or traveling to areas where they've been documented to have diagnosed cases of COVID-19? The answer is going to be yes to that. I mean, it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, at this point, yes. Yeah. Does your business increase the probability of employees exposed to infected individuals? Go through what your business structure is. I don't know. I can't answer that, but most likely, yes. Do your employees work in close proximity with vendors or other partners who may have employees, you know, at a greater potential to contact COVID-19? Most likely, yes. And so you need to come up and recognize how to manage your business and mitigate these claims down the line to lessen the effect of a negligence claim in the future. And so what we're trying to do is strip away potential negligence before it happens. Yeah. And part of protection planning. Maybe you don't have employees, but you have tenants, right? These are your customers and you have some sense of responsibility and obligation to perform, you know, to those people. So yeah, as real estate investors, we have a responsibility to do certain things, right? And with that comes risk. Or even just if you, you know, sending an agent to go scope out a property or a general contractor to go here. Good point. Yeah. I mean, it's everything in your business. I mean, if you're hiring someone to go do a task for you and they get COVID-19, there's going to be potential liability down the line. Yeah. Well, Brian, we don't mean to scare everybody. This is certainly something that's easily achievable and scalable for the everyday investor out there, as you've kind of said. So, you know, if you're out there and you're listening and you're thinking, hey, I'm just getting started, don't let this conversation scare you off. Rather, be proactive about it. It's something you can wrap your head around. It's something that you can, you know, implement in your life and your assets and in your investment strategy. So I think that's uh, kind of the takeaway. It is. And it, that's why I was hesitant to talk about the last <laughs> Yeah. And I do not want to get people freaked out. It's just my job is preventative planning. Sure. And it just, it has to be a conversation that has to be had. But the rest of it is just, you have liability as a business owner and investor. Be proactive, figure out where you are on the sliding scale. Something's better than nothing. Just be proactive and plan and protect what you have. Awesome. Yeah. 
Well, Brian, with that, let's uh, wrap up with the lightning round, a series of questions we ask every one of our guests. Are you up for it? Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. So we'll kind of gear this a bit towards real estate investing. I know you've got some experience yourself, so let's take that with it. Mm -hmm. First question is, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And then what'd you do to overcome that? Failure to launch. I was obsessed about having to research and read every book and every ebook and every whatever. <laughs> yes. But, and it just created this inter like, I can never learn enough, never learn enough. And eventually they all got repetitive. And I just, the way I got over it was just saying, like, I do everything else, just jump in the deep end. Like, the best way to do it is just to do it and learn. I agree. Awesome. Do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? No, I don't think I have a personal habit. Like, I'm just very organized and structured, but I allow for flexibility because my whole life has been about pivoting. So, you know, I create a plan, I reflect on plans and ideas and thoughts and business, but I also realize it may not go that way. So just be adaptable. Yeah, good philosophy. Well, Brian, do you have an online resource you find valuable in your day to day? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to take it out of the law because most of you guys aren't lawyers. So I'm going to <laughs> so for real estate investors. I really like bigger pockets. I think yeah, that's a sure. great free resource, you know, and you can maximize it however you want. And then there's a few other, you know, great, you know, I also like the Oxford Club for because I love stocks also, you know, and okay. I find it to be a great, resource. great. Yeah. We'll link both of those in the show notes for our audience members haven't ever heard of bigger pockets, unlikely, but Oxford Club will also link. Yeah. Brian, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? Everyone's always going to be like, oh, cat, you know, was it Robert Kiyosaki? Um, rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? <laughs> dad. So I'll just go awesome. Richest Man of Babylon, I think, is a great way because it opens up your mind into starting the process of becoming your own bank. You know, you're learning about leverage and using notes because I love investing in notes. And it started because of becoming my own bank. Yeah, that's great. Dad. Yeah, The Richest Man in Babylon. We'll link that book in the show notes, another classic. Brian, last question in the lightning round. If you were to go back and give advice to your 20-year-old self to get started investing in real estate or in the entrepreneurship world, what would you tell yourself? Don't be a punk. You know, like check your ego <laughs> at the door. You know, it's like you can be as smart as you want, but if you're not coachable or you're not going to listen or, you know, you just have a bad perception of something, you know, just learn when you're young. Even if you're really, really smart and a genius, show up, shut up, you know, and you'll get far, you know, learn your job. I love that. Awesome. Well, Brian, it's been a lot of fun talking with you, looking about how real estate investors can mitigate risk in the world, the uncertain world we live in today, right? So there's only so much we can distill in a one-hour podcast, but if members want to learn more about this world of asset protection, maybe reach out and connect with you. Where's the best place for them to learn more or reach you? Yeah, they can reach me. I might email brian, B-R-I-A-N at btblegal.com or my website www.btblegal.com. And I do free consultations because I think so many people are hesitant to call lawyers and pay a consultation fee that they just try to become Google lawyers, like Google doctors. So I just rather have people, you know, get the analysis, let me go over everything. I'll give you my two cents. I'll even explain to you how to scale things up. If you use me, great. Sometimes I might be out of your price range. Sometimes not. I kind of put ourselves in the middle. But just take the free education, go on the resources I have on my website and get answers wherever you go after that is, you know, I just hope you have the education. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. That's btblegal.com. You can go there, schedule a free consultation, see if, you know, your assets are properly protected, see what you can do to further that protection. Brian, thanks so much for all that great information. As we're wrapping up here, any parting piece of advice you'd like to leave with the audience members? Yeah, don't let fear paralyze you. You know, whatever you're going to do, you know, it's easy to fall into fear, failure to launch syndrome, anxiety. You know, you control your own destiny. So don't let yourself get paralyzed. Awesome. I love it. Well, Brian, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Take care. Yeah. All right. That wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Brian Bradley. Hey, I hope you got so much information from that conversation. Asset protection is an important piece of your real estate investing strategy, and it doesn't have to be overly complicated, as you can tell. Starting out simply, you can use things like insurance and equity in your home to LLCs and scaling up from there. So don't feel overwhelmed if some of this is new to you. It's new for me as well. So if you have any questions or want to learn more about the subject, you can visit 
btblegal.com. We'll link that in the show notes. And as always, for more information, resources, and to connect with me, you can do so at www.jacobayers.com. And hey, something else I want to announce from the website there, you can go over to airsacquisitions.com. And if you'd like to connect, you can schedule a call from the site there. So if you want to reach out, connect with me, please do so. I love hearing from you. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.